So we now get into the development of the uh, transmission line analysis and uh, we uh, mentioned that we are going to be focused on controlled geometry transmission lines. So if we look at some of those examples, the parallel wire, the coaxial, a strip line where you have a conductor at the bottom, that's typically what we call the ground plane, and a strip on the top and there is dielectric in between, and all these configurations and some of the other ones that we've seen earlier like the twisted pair and all that, we can claim these are all control geometry. In other words, the cross section anywhere we take would give us the same exact cross-sectional configuration. That's what we mean by control geometry. We mentioned that we are going to use circuit theory approach in developing the analysis. And we mentioned the RLCG model. So basically we are looking now at the physical properties of those wires and the insulation material. We're looking at those wires here that have some internal resistance. We have some inductance magnetic field developing. We have some capacitance between the wires. We have some imperfect insulator between the two so there's some leakage current through it. Same thing you look here also internal resistance, inductance, magnetic field, capacitance between the two as well as also leakage current through the dielectric. Same thing here in the cross section. So what we're talking about is that kind of a situation two wires, whether it's coaxial or otherwise, or parallel, internal resistance, internal inductance, internal conductance, internal capacitance. Those internal elements are distributed. They are not lumped at some particular location. They are everywhere along the length of the wire itself. And they are uniformly distributed in that control geometry configuration that we talk about. So if we take a, an increment of that, let's say a delta length, call that a delta z, call this one here the z-axis. Right? If I take a delta z of that, there will be a delta r in there. And that delta r will be some linear distribution related to the length itself. And let's say the r sub z is the amount of resistance per unit length. So delta R here in this part is RZ times delta Z. Likewise, I can say the same thing about delta L, the amount of inductance in the same delta Z. If I take a delta Z, the amount of inductance here would be again LZ delta Z, the amount of conductance, amount of capacitance, delta C is CZ delta Z. So the RZ, LZ, CZ, and GZ are what we call the per unit length properties. So Rz is ohms per meter, Henry's per meter, Farad's per meter, Siemens per meter. That's the RLCG model that we are talking about. So here we go. We start our analysis by assuming that I have a transmission line. Here's the transmission line. And I'll put a source on one end and a termination on the other end or a load. Sending end, receiving end source end, load end, generator, termination. You know, there are so many ways you can name that. And let's assume that this line here is stretched along a z-axis. That starts at z is equal to zero and ends at z is equal to L. That's the length of the line. Simple case. So we can start with that. Obviously, 
the actual physical circuits may be more complicated, but we uh, start by a simple case so we can get the analysis without too much complication. Within that length of the wire, there is a distribution. Here it is. R is distributed everywhere. L is distributed everywhere. C and G. All these distributed elements here. To develop the voltage current relationship along that length, I'm going to select delta Z, an increment, small increment of that transmission line, a delta Z. And I'm going to look closely at that. I'll find the delta R, I'll find the delta L, I'll find the delta G, and the delta C. We gave the expressions for those before. So that increment here is located between the position Z and Z plus delta Z. So, consequently, if this is my voltage V of Z, the voltage here is not going to be the same as voltage there. We already agreed to that. There will be change as a result of the size of the circuit relative to the wavelength. V of Z, that will be V of Z plus delta Z. If the current N is I of Z, is the current there is I of Z plus delta Z. And the convention that we are using here is the current goes in the positive Z direction here, going backwards in the other conductor, and the voltage is positive on the top, negative at the bottom. Just a choice of convention so we can write our equations. Right? So if that's the V of Z and I of Z, and it changes to the position, as you can see, the R and L is going to cause a voltage drop, and the G and C is going to cause a current drop. You know, this one here is in series, this one here is in shunt. So I can write the differential change in the current and the voltage relative to the initial voltage and current based on the circuit elements. And that's going to be exactly what we are going to do. Uh, now we are ready to apply KVL and KCL for the delta Z equivalent circuit that we spoke about earlier, delta R, delta L, delta G, delta C, on an interval delta Z of the transmission line. Uh, here we do time domain and frequency domain analyses for uh, more exposure and, and more un better understanding. Um, in the voltage uh, expression here in the time domain we use lowercase, the voltage expression here we use uppercase, similarly for the current. Uh, we write simply that the voltage here is equal to this voltage plus that voltage, and the current here is equal to this uh, uh, current here plus that current, the branching of this uh, node here. So we write those expressions, KVL and KCL in both of them, and they are fairly um, reasonable. You can read them here, and uh, as it turns out that we are going to have uh, expressions uh, that uh, have delta Z in them for the voltage and expression that will have delta Z in them for the current because uh, you have an increment R delta Z here and the voltage here is uh, in respect to delta Z. So we have to take the limit as delta Z goes to zero to convert these difference equations into differential equations. So we end up with um, the uh, uh, following equation here for the voltage right there. Okay, let me highlight that. And we're going to end up with this following equation here for the current. Uh, these are simultaneous equations, V here in terms of I and I in terms of V. So we need to get one variable here, plug it into the other one, and reduce them to one variable. As we do that, we have to differentiate. So as we make this substitution between uh, these uh, two simultaneous equations, we end up with a second order differential equation in one variable right here which is uh, voltage with respect to uh, Z in terms of voltage with respect to time, no more current. Uh, likewise, here in the other side, you end up with this um, kind of an equation here. Now, these are voltage expressions. Uh, we could have done a similar thing for the current expressions, in which case um, uh, you will end up with uh, I's instead of V's, uh, but is, are going to be the identi same identical equations, by the way. All right. Now, how do we solve these equations? The time domain expression here um, uh, requires uh, going to the Laplace transform to get rid of this partial V partial T. The frequency domain, the differential equation is more straightforward. 
as we do Laplace transform on the time domain, uh, we end up with this expression right here. All right? And guess what? It's identical to the same expression that we had for the frequency domain. And that makes sense because basically the Laplace domain and the frequency domain uh, have similar expressions except for s instead of j omega. The s has a real part which is sigma, which is useful in solving transient um, uh, state uh, analysis, while the frequency domain can only be used for harmonic analysis. Now, if we define this quantity here as gamma squared, you end up with this reduced equation, similar thing we're doing here, and the solution is of this form here. Uh, what kind of a function that you differentiate twice and end up with the same function multiplied by gamma squared, and that's basically either an exponential or sine or cosine. We use exponential because it's more convenient and actually covers the sines and cosines. So end up with this expression here. We have two coefficients here. We just named them v plus and v minus for reasons that will be apparent later on. But for now, the just two arbitrary constants as coefficients of the solution. Likewise here for the frequency domain one. These are uh, similar expressions. Uh, we uh, can get the current expressions by going back to the original equations and making some more substitution, and we end up with the current expression. Here it is, current, current. Uh, in the Laplace domain, uh, again, it has the s, and this one has j omega. Uh, the coefficient here uh, is uh, the units of inverse impedance, so we'll call it 1 over z0. Uh, same, similar thing here. The thing to notice here is, as a result of this solution, we have a minus sign here as opposed to a plus sign there. All right. So the current expression is similar to the voltage expression except for a minus sign and a coefficient uh, of 1 over impedance there. Okay, now that we have uh, the solution uh, uh, as a function of position, uh, we need to go back now and get the uh, time variation solution. As it turned out that we cannot do that in the general sense uh, easily, so we're going to uh, take a shortcut here and let's say, why don't we just do it for a simple case of a lossless line, which means uh, r is equal to 0 and g is equal to 0. In, in this case here, the solution reduces to this form here which simply says that the voltage and current uh, have a similar form to the original voltage and current, except the time is shifted by a quantity here depending on position. In other words, there will be a delay for the signal to travel down the line. As Z increases, obviously the delay is going to increase, and this is a coefficient of delay here, or basically, if you wish, has to do with the velocity of the propagation of the signal down the line. There is uh, a, a V uh, of T minus and a V of T plus. It looks like uh, we have two different shapes of delays here. This one here is a delay while this one here is advance. Uh, when, when, when we explain it later, uh, there's obviously uh, no sense for having an advance. Basically, this one here is the same exact delay, but things are traveling in the opposite direction, and that's why the uh, plus instead of a minus. Okay, uh, right here is the same same thing for a harmonic signal. We can see also again uh, the cosine signal of omega t minus a, sh a shift. Here is another shift. Here is the same shift that we are seeing here. In fact, and it's again functional position, uh, linear root position if beta is constant. Uh, by the way, alpha and beta were nothing but the real and imaginary parts of of the gamma. Uh, quantity here. We'll explain all that in the next lecture. And the current is similar to the voltage expression again with the proper uh, modifier 1 over z naught and the proper change in polarity of the minus sign. Um, next lecture, we're going to explain the physical insight of all this. What does gamma mean? Uh, what does uh, v plus and v minus mean? Uh, alpha and beta, uh, square root of LC, all these constants here uh, are going to make sense to us uh, once we go the uh, uh, through the next lecture. Uh, we'll stop here. Thank you. Hello. This is Lecture 2, Chapter 2, Transmission Lines, Wave Equations. 
In the first lecture, we considered a transmission line, a pair of conductors, source at one end and a load at another end. And supposedly, we are sending a signal from the source to the load. And we would like to get a full understanding of what happens as a result of this communication media or transmission media that connects the source to the load here. So we looked at the transmission line as a pair of conductors and we produced a physically based model of distributed resistance, distributed inductance, distributed resistance, distributed capacitance. And we started writing the differential equation that describes the voltage and current on the line at different locations. And to do that, what we've done was to take an increment, look closely at the increment, delta R, delta L, delta G, delta C, and looked at the voltage and current at one end of the increment in terms of the voltage and current of the uh, other increment. And that ended up to be a difference equation. We took the limit as delta Z goes to zero. We end up with a differential equation. The equations that we uh, found and the solution for those equation was basically V of Z is equal to V plus E to the minus gamma Z plus V minus E to the plus gamma Z, where gamma was a square root of R plus J omega L times G plus J omega C. The current equation was in the form of 1 over Z naught times a similar equation, except we have a minus sign here instead of a plus. And the Z naught was basically given by a square root of the ratio. We express gamma as real and imaginary, so we express also Z naught as real and imaginary. This solution here all right, had lots of things here that we need to understand and relate to. V plus, for example, V minus. These are arbitrary constants. Whenever you solve a differential equation, you end up with some constants. Well, gamma. Well, these are not arbitrary now. This is simply related to the physical model of the transmission line. The R, L, C, and G, and the frequency. Z naught, again, it's a physical parameter that relates to R, L, G, and C, and the frequency. So we want to see the physical implication of these parameters here, as well as what these constants are all about. So that's what this lecture is about. Uh, it's important to recognize that this is basically a frequency domain solution. It's very obvious. We're using uppercase V and we have a J omega, uppercase I, and we have a J omega here as well. These expressions are all in the frequency domain. That was the right column of the table that we did last lecture in lecture one, where we did the time domain solution on the left hand side and the frequency domain solution on the right hand side. Well, as you recall in chapter one, we discussed how important it is to get back to the time domain to be able to relate to the physical model or the physical insight of what's happening here. So here was the time domain solution. If you recall again from last chapter, equation 29 and 30, here they are. That's the time domain solution. V of Z and T, lowercase now, is equal to the same V plus that we have here, but now is a magnitude. That's not a complex number anymore e to the minus alpha z cosine omega t minus beta z plus some phase. And the v minus term have e to the plus alpha z, alpha being the real part of the gamma here. Gamma is equal to alpha plus j beta. All right. So e to the plus alpha z cosine omega t plus beta z, again plus, because you have a plus here versus a minus here. And you have a phase that corresponds to the v minus. The i is likewise uh, magnitude of v plus over z naught, similar expression. So these are the time domain expressions that will hopefully explain to us what's going on. Now, if we take the case of a lossless line where the internal resistance r is equal to zero and the internal conductance g is equal to zero, no losses, no resistance, no conductance only inductance and capacitance. The expression for gamma, if you go back here and put r is equal to zero and put g is equal to zero, you get j omega l times j omega. Here it is. All right. Gamma becomes pure imaginary. No more alpha. Alpha is zero. And you have gamma is equal to j omega square root of lc. And z naught is real. Square root of l over c. No more j's. If you look, recall here, z naught had a j in it. 
all right well z naught here is pure real the reactance here is gone all right so that is your um, answer or these are your parameters in the lossless case the v plus is equal to v plus e to the minus j beta z and v minus e to the plus j beta z and the i likewise if we look at the time domain now look at this this e to the minus alpha z is gone so we have that v plus there it is cosine omega t minus b plus v minus e to the plus alpha z is gone it's only cosine all right so that all was done last lecture we are putting it here back as a review all right let's go to the physical implication 